I'm Dr. Nageshri Sitaramu. I'm a medical oncologist practicing within Northville Health System. I specialize in head and neck cancer and thoracic malignancies. So immunocompromised may mean a lot of things. So our bodies are equipped with a lot of barriers in place um, to fight off anything that don't belong to us, like infections, virus, bacteria, parasites, uh, cancer. These are things that we um, should never have had. And, and sometimes, so, some, you know, and, and we need these, this strong system in place so that uh, our body's shielded from all these external um, unwanted things. So when patients are immunocompromised, we generally mean that their immune system, as we say, the cells that fight cancer, the cells that fight bacteria are not working as well. So sometimes it happens naturally. Uh, some people are born with uh, a deficient or a low immune system, uh, affected immune system. Uh, but for the most part, it is something that, you know, treatments for other conditions can result as a side effect. So for example, patients with cancer receiving chemotherapy you know, while treating the cancer, while killing the cancer cells, which is the desired effect, there may be undesired side effects like killing the immune cells, which are in place to fight off bacteria, virus, and other things. So patients on chemotherapy in general are considered immunosuppressed. Certain infections like HIV can also cause immune suppression because there are causing the immune cells to, to not work as well. So there are several reasons for the immune system to not work as well as uh, it should be. And we should be cognizant that there are many reasons for it. Patients are with, uh, let's say, um, severe rheumatoid arthritis who are on medications or uh, these, some of these medications can also cause um, the immune system to not work so well. So it's not just cancer patients. There are many other groups of people who have low immune system and, and this, this uh, you know, um, should be kept in mind. In general, it is considered one of the risk factors uh, based on data that we have from China and Italy, um, where, where COVID happened, uh, the pandemic uh, peaked before us. We know that cancer patients receiving chemotherapy were at higher risk for complications from COVID. But in general, it really depends. It's, it's a very complex question. It really depends on the type of cancer, the type of treatment that patients are receiving, where they are in their cancer trajectory, what type of, you know, where they are in terms of getting, uh, receiving treatment. Um, my expertise is lung and head and neck. As you can imagine, a lot of uh, my patients with lung cancer have underlying lung conditions. Many of them have um, COPD, emphysema. Um, they've had surgeries done. They've taken parts of their lungs out um, in order to remove their tumors. And on top of that, they've received chemotherapy, maybe radiation. So because of all those, they, uh, they have lower lung uh, reserve, lung volume reserves. So there is lesser lung that they're working with than normal people. So they are more vulnerable to getting complications. Whether they are more vulnerable to actually contracting the, the, the virus, probably not so. But may, if they do contract, I think they would be at a higher risk for developing complications. So the message is to really try and uh, exercise all the precautions that have been discussed in public, you know, social distancing, trying to keep um, away from gatherings, using um, self hygiene, um, uh, hand sanitizers, et cetera, you know, and, and make sure wash hands multiple times. The normal recommendations for everyone holds for cancer patients as well.
Oral cancer therapies are a little different. There are some actual chemotherapy drugs. Chemotherapy drugs are those that are designed to kill cancer cells by a non-specific mechanism. So the, the chemotherapy that we give intravenously are non-specific drugs. They're not specifically targeted. There are some oral drugs that are that that um, are actual chemotherapy drugs. But in general, when we talk about oral drugs, they are uh, targeted drugs. They target a specific uh, mutation within the tumor. So in general, they target uh, the, the tumor, but there are some unwanted side effects. But in general, they're not considered immunosuppressive for the most part. They don't really affect the immune system in a negative way like chemotherapy drugs do. However, they do affect the natural barriers. For example, drugs for a certain type of lung cancer called erlotinib or simertinib. Um, these drugs can cause a skin rash. They can cause uh, inflammation or um, some irritation of the nose, the oral cavity. Um, and in that sense, you do lose those natural barriers. So if they do come in contact with another um, person who is asymptomatic, who doesn't have any symptoms, but is carrying the COVID virus, they may be at a higher risk to, to um, contract the, the virus and be symptomatic from it. Um, so in, in that sense, they are still vulnerable. So the good thing about these drugs is that allow, they allow us to treat patients at home. They don't really need to come to the center. Um, we can do telehealth to check on them. We could even send um, the lab. We can also get the lab draws done at home so that everything is done at the confines of their home without them having to, to get up out of their um, safety net to uh, come to doctor's visits or get blood work or, or anything or receive their treatments. That's also a very complex question, kind of depends on the scenario. So, um, and I think it's a multidisciplinary decision. So whenever we have uh, patients who are newly diagnosed within this era of the pandemic, um, we bring it to the tumor board. We discuss collectively as a group. As uh, in many institutions, particularly um, in areas where there is, there is a lot of uh, COVID cases, uh, many floors in the hospital have been converted to COVID floors. So uh, a lot of surgical units have been taken over by uh, either COVID floor or a COVID ICU. So elective surgeries are, um, are not being done in many institutions. So that keeping in mind, if it's an early cancer, let's say um, a very early stage oral cancer, just keeping in line with what I do, um, you know, what I um, have expertise in, if it's an early stage oral cancer, and we know that it takes a long time for it to progress from, um, from you know, where it is, from stage one to a higher stage, um, with very aggressive follow-up, we uh, follow them closely and tell them that, that it's safe to watch and, and wait till after the pandemic is over. However, there are many situations where an urgent treatment is needed. So we have two conditions that we are facing. One is an active cancer, which if you don't treat immediately, is, is, uh, could be lethal. Uh, and then we have the risk, a very high risk, of um, putting these subjects, uh, putting these patients to uh, developing complications from COVID. So it's a very hard decision sometimes. So we have all institutionally and even regionally, nationally developed some guidelines. So we have moved uh, from patients who have normally undergone surgery and then come to us for chemotherapy later on. Now we have sometimes reversed the process. So patients get chemotherapy uh, first, try to shrink the tumor down, make it more amenable or more possible to have a surgical resection later. So we kind of hold the pattern, hold, hold the course while patients uh, are getting some form of treatment for their, for their cancer while awaiting a more curative procedure, which is surgery. Um, there are some situations where patients are on immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is a new class of drug. 
which boosts one's own immune system to fight cancer. And this has really made its place in uh, treatment of almost all cancers now. Um, the luxury of this, patients still have to come here for intravenous treatment, but, um, but it's just a half an hour infusion. Uh, it does not suppress the immune system. And for the most part, it's very um, tolerable. So we have the luck, we have guidelines and uh, you know, plenty of experience from other countries now and even within the US now that we can space it out. So instead of uh, every three weeks, patients can come every six weeks or four to six weeks, we make, make our own regimens depending on where the patients are in their treatment, how well they've been responding, uh, what is the amount of disease or cancer that we're dealing with. A lot of factors go into, um, into, the, into making the decision. Uh, but we have, because of these smart drugs, oral drugs as well as immunotherapy and other smart drugs, we have the luxury of uh, making some decisions that uh, we believe um, are helpful to the patient in, in, in treating their cancer, but at the same time, keeping them um, as protected from COVID as possible. Well, um, elective surveillance testing, um, it, it, it kind of uh, depends. If there was something that was noted on a previous scan and that needed an earlier follow-up, I think that's a different situation. But for routine, if everything has been good for the last several years or whatever um, number of um, uh, months, um, there are guidelines within individual radiological institutions to put off uh, these uh, screening procedures or surveillance procedures. Um, it is completely safe to do so. So these, you know, the surveillance scans generally are, are um, there really is flexibility within uh, for several months, even in normal circumstances. But within this pandemic, I think the risk of contracting COVID and having complications from it, I think, um, exceeds any potential benefit from going through these routine procedures which have been stable for many months and years. <laughs>